Well, we're going to go ahead and start our keynote. Um, and I actually, I'm uh, Dr. Pat Conrad, and I are going to do a joint keynote in keeping with the spirit of today's event. So I will, I will start. At Dr. Conrad, I'm sorry, let me introduce Dr. Conrad. She is the professor of parasitology at UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine and is co-chair of the event. She's also co-director of the One Health Center of Expertise for the University of California and a leading force in One Health and global health initiatives and research. And it's really a pleasure and a privilege to be co-chairing this event with you and Dr. Scott. Six years ago, I was asked by the veterinarians at the Los Angeles Zoo to perform a transesophageal echocardiogram on a chimpanzee with lethargy. Zoos across the country have medical advisory boards, and physicians like myself have the privilege of helping out with the occasional subspecialty need. I'd done this procedure on many human patients over the years, but never on a chimpanzee. So excitedly, I finished my morning rounds at UCLA, and 30 minutes and three freeways later, I stepped into the procedure room of the Gottlieb Animal Health and Conservation Center. There was my patient, sedated and intubated, like many of the human patients I do this procedure on. With a sense of great respect, I approached her, probe in hand. I placed the tip of the probe below her endotracheal tube at the back of her throat and gently slid the transducer into her esophagus. Then, as I always do, I turned around to look at the ultrasound screen. What I saw looked something like this. <coughs> Ventricles, valves, atria, septae, but what caught me off guard that morning wasn't the shared physiology, it was the shared pathophysiology. Because the image in front of me, with its thickened ventricular walls and biatrial enlargement, was literally the picture of restrictive cardiomyopathy, a common cause of human heart failure. And I felt surprise. But my surprise was nearly immediately replaced by annoyance at my surprise. I mean, I knew this. I shouldn't have been surprised. I knew we shared a common ancestor with the modern chimpanzee only five to seven million years ago. It's a, that's a blink, right? I mean, but I knew this. And I had not missed the media storm that followed the mapping of the chimpanzee genome, that 99% genetic similarity broadcasting our close relatedness with animals. But still, Somehow I felt that human disease was, well, uniquely human. So I rationalized. Maybe it was just cardiovascular, uh, or maybe just great apes. But I had this chance, wonderful opportunity, practicing human medicine most of the time, but occasionally examining a variety of animals, and listening to veterinarians on rounds discuss differential diagnoses, which included malignancy, hypothyroidism, dysmenorrhea, and cardiac tamponade. Now, I know what you vets are thinking. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> but how many times has a physician client come into your office with their pet and said something like, really, cats get polycystic kidney disease? My dog has epilepsy? Well, today, I'm asking all of you to forgive us, because human medicine <laughs> has this way of narrowing our focus of attention. For example, I can tell you a lot about how an ultrasound beam bounces off a friable thrombus at the tip of the left atrial appendage. But I would be of no help identifying the cause of that funky rash on your torso. And you definitely wouldn't want me to do your kidney transplant. So perhaps it is understandable that we don't know much about the diseases of other species. We don't know much about the diseases of other organs. As a human doc, I hadn't known, but I wanted to. How extensive was this overlap between human and animal pathology? So I began an informal personal study. 
with the help of the librarians at the UCLA Biomedical Library, I created veterinary and wildlife literature search strategies. As I encountered diagnoses in human patients during the day, I looked for animal correlates later in the evening. And the questions came pouring in. Do animals get breast cancer? OCD. Dilated cardiomyopathy. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Melanoma. Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. Lymphoma. Do they get glioblastoma or leukemia or aortic dissection or syphilis? Really? Syphilis, I thought. <laughs> and as every veterinarian in this room knows, the answer to each and every one of these questions is a resounding yes. Now, it is with some embarrassment and reluctance that I am exposing to this esteemed audience today my lack of awareness at that time. But I am doing so because I believe it is shared by many of my physician colleagues. Our two fields have operated in fairly disconnected professional silos. The why behind this is interesting, touching on historical and cultural elements in the history of medicine and maybe even man's view of himself in the universe. But more important than the why is the what. What are the costs of this gap and what opportunities might emerge by closing this gap? Now, I'm not the first physician to understand this connection between animal and human health. The founding fathers of our field understood this. Uh, Rudolf Virchow in the 19th century, you know, the father of modern pathology, wrote, between animal and human medicine, there is no dividing line, nor should there be. The object is different, but the experience obtained constitutes the basis of all medicine. And Sir William Osler, also a student of Dr. Virchow, who was uh, one of the founders of the, uh, the McGill School of Veterinary Medicine, and taught veterinary medicine. Um, uh, and this is another fascinating story that veterinarians, are, he is the father of both of our fields. Um, well, more recently, groups including the World Health Organization, Institutes of Medicine, and many, many others are calling for more engagement between human and animal medicine. This growing movement is called One Health. And Dr. Conrad will be talking to you in a moment about the global health concerns which call urgently for greater collaboration between our fields. But today's conference is meant to speak to the clinician, to foster an understanding that there is a connection between animal and human patients, whether encountered on a hillside or at the bedside. My own epiphany, facilitated by the experience at the zoo, literally changed my life. How I understand and treat my patients, how I treat and uh, my patients, how I teach, and how I understand the connection between the environment and health. Over the past three years, along with medical journalist Catherine Bowers, I've attended veterinary conferences all over the country, interviewed hundreds of academic and clinical veterinarians and wildlife biologists, trying to understand how the health of all species might be improved by bringing our fields closer together. Today's conference itself is an effort to create a living laboratory to see what new insights might emerge from coming together as professions. Before I close, I want to share a quick story which illustrates the cost and possibly the opportunities at stake here. A few years ago, I was at the zoo pre uh, preparing to image a tamarind with suspected heart failure. She was in a little plexiglass box getting anesthesia. I crouched down next to the box because she was so cute, and I stared closely into her beautiful eyes. But as I did that, one of the vets put their hand on my, my shoulder and said, please stop staring at her like that. You're going to give her capture myopathy. She's going to be scared. You stop it. And I, I, I did stop doing that, but I thought, capture myopathy, I'd, I'd never heard of that. But when I got home, I Googled, and I learned the capture myopathy is a syndrome seen in a variety of species, many different species. And typically, these animals, after being chased or sometimes restrained, but typically very scared, terrified, will have a surge of catecholamines and many adverse end organ effects, and sometimes heart failure and even death. 
Now, I had fully finished reading the, the Google material when I did a literal double take because capture myopathy sounded an awful lot like a recently characterized human disorder, the broken heart syndrome, also called Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. Takotsubo cardiomyopathy is a syndrome in which human patients who are hit with extremes in emotion, such as grief or fear, have chest pain and EKG changes. They come to an emergency room, they go to the cardiac cath lab, and their coronary arteries are found to be normal. But their ventricle has this unusual bulging shape. The Japanese cardiologist who described the syndrome felt the shape looked like the pots that the fishermen use to capture octopus. And therefore, the syndrome was called Takatsubo, which is uh, the octopus pot uh, uh, shape. So I thought about Takatsubo cardiomyopathy, and I thought about capture myopathy. High emotion, high emotion, autonomic activation, autonomic activation, surge of catechols, catechols, acute heart failure, acute heart failure, sometimes death, sometimes death. And I began to suspect that Takotsubo cardiomyopathy and the cardiac aspect of capture myopathy weren't second cousins or first cousins or even siblings. They were one and the same. But it wasn't the overlap that hit me. It was the gulf. Because while Takotsubo cardiomyopathy was described with much fanfare in the year 2000, it had been known in the veterinary literature for over three decades. Now, I can't tell you what the costs of this gap have been, but it has got me to thinking, what if a human oncologist had been spending time with veterinarians taking care of their cancer patients? What about nephrologists or neurologists? Should our psychiatry residents spend a month rotating with animal behaviorists? What might their Takatsubo moments be? Seated here today at the Ronald Reagan UCLA Medical Center are representatives from both of our professions. And it was former President Reagan who stood more than 20 years ago at the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin and said the now famous words, tear down that wall. So today, I thought it fitting to borrow these words and turn them toward the less concrete, but no less real wall that has divided animal and human medicine. Today, together, let's start taking down that wall. Thank you. So as, in the same tone as, as Barb, I'd um, like to share with you in the um, brief time that I have, um, some of the aha moments that have occurred um, in my life that have really served to show me the power and the benefit of human and animal, looking at health from a human and animal perspective. Growing up as a cowgirl in Colorado, surrounded by dogs, cats, chickens, geese, pigs, uh, you name it, it's no surprise that I chose to go into veterinary medicine and all the way through my senior year, fully intended to come out being a practicing mixed large and small animal veterinarian. But then I had an aha moment, an epiphany of sorts um, during my senior year when I realized, you know, there's only one animal species that we as veterinarians are not responsible for. Um, but that's a species that we still could um, benefit. Now, as veterinarians, we certainly can't save the starving children in Darfur, or when I was a child, um, those in Biafra, um, as shown here. But we can help to do something about hunger and malnutrition. And particularly in countries where, um, like this in East Africa, where livestock production is such an important part of the nutrition and health of communities um, where crops cannot completely meet the nutritional needs. So it was this um, inspiration that, uh, that really changed the whole course of my professional career and ended up leading me on a journey that took me eventually to East Africa 
um, where I went to work at the International Laboratory for Research on Animal Diseases, a laboratory that had been set up by the United Nations and the Rockefeller Foundation with the mission to develop vaccines against the diseases that were considered to be the major constraints to livestock production in Africa. And the one that I worked on for the next four years was East Coast fever. This is a little uh, single-cell protozoal parasite transmitted by ticks that has devastating effects with over 90% mortality in susceptible uh, cattle populations. By the time I went to Kenya to work on this disease, there already was an infection and treatment vaccination method that had been developed for East Coast fever, um, which worked brilliantly in the laboratory, unfortunately not so well in the field. And this is a slide of one of the early vaccination trials um, that was conducted in the Ngong Hills in Kenya. Um, you may note here the bleached uh, vulture picked bones of the vaccinated cattle. Um, so in trying to investigate what went wrong when cattle went to the field, um, it was concluded that these were the culprits. It was African Cape buffalo, which harbored tyleria parasites, which caused East Coast fever, um, and had no ill effect to them. But thanks to the ticks that fed on both the buffalo and the cattle, these parasites were transmitted to cattle where they were um, very pathogenic. So this is what I spent four years on, trying to identify these parasites and determine which ones were being transmitted and were the most pathogenic. And in the course of that, I really came to appreciate this relationship between wildlife and domestic animals and what occurs um, when disease organisms are transmitted, transmitted from one to the other. And in this case, the African Cape buffalo was the major source of the most pathogenic tylerial parasites. But as we studied this further and others went on, we of course found that other artiodactylids, undulates such as a waterbuck, eland, and greater kudu could all serve as hosts for um, tylerial parasites. So after four years, when I came to California to join the faculty of School of Veterinary Medicine, I was saddened by the fact that oh, we don't have East Coast fever in the United States. G good news for the cattle, bad news for a tyleriologist. Um, but the next closest thing that we had um, was another tick transmitted um, blood parasite. Um, and pictured here, you see the little spots um, inside those red blood cells. Um, these are Babesia parasites. They cause a disease known as Babesiosis. Um, and the particular Babesia parasites that we have in, in the United States, or the most important one at that time, was this Babesia microti that caused disease in, in the human population. Now, fascinating disease, um, unfortunately the, the vector wasn't nearly as exciting or intimidating as those that I had dealt with in Africa. Uh, um, Paramiscus little deer mice, the same reservoir host as that um, for Lyme disease. And the other problem was that Babesia microti human infections had not been identified in California or the Western United States, except in people who had traveled from endemic areas in the East and the Midwest. So, so that was a bit of a problem, but thankfully, and here I, have, I owe a great debt to the veterinarians of Southern California, especially out in the Lancaster area, just east of here, who um, astutely noted they had a lot of dogs with um, what appeared to be autoimmune hemolytic anemia, um, but a clinical pathologist noted that those dogs actually had little blood parasites that looked very much like these shown here um, in the blood smears of those dogs. So it actually was a small Babesia parasite that hadn't been known to occur um, in, except in one reported case in the United States. So that was fun. It was great working with the veterinarians of Southern California, but, but another important aha came from this experience. And that was looking at these slides of these dogs and having established collaborations working on the human babesiosis with uh, collaborators at Harvard um, School of Public Health, the Mayo Clinic, and the, and the CDC, I was struck by um, how similar these parasites were, were. And as a veterinarian, couldn't help but wonder about the zoonotic potential of that dog parasite. 
how could we be sure that all of those little parasites that we were seeing in the blood of humans were actually Babesia microti? It's like in Africa, if you see parasites, it's malaria. But here we, in the United States, we call it, we think of Babesia first. So it was because we asked this question that the CDC um, sent us the blood sample from a human case um, that occurred in Washington State. A, man, a farmer who was hospitalized with babesiosis, but he had no serologic response to Babesia microti. And so we wanted to find out if this was possibly a parasite that was infectious for dogs and the same one we've been working on in Southern California. Well, it wasn't, but it was a whole new species of Babesia. Um, that we recently named Babesia duncani, which we know now is endemic in the western United States, in Washington, Oregon, and we've identified cases in California. But I mention this because this is a discovery that was only made possible by this collaboration. Physicians, scientists, parasitologists, from all of those institutions working together to make this discovery. Now, we don't know the reservoir host of this Babesia duncani um, parasite um, yet. Uh, we have some uh, suspects because the most closely related parasites um, are found in deer and in desert bighorn sheep. Um, but we haven't determined for sure that the, this is the source of the parasites. Now, this whole idea of transmission of pathogens from wildlife um, to, uh, to domestic animals and to humans is probably not a foreign concept for you. Um, if you haven't heard of babesiosis, you probably have heard of some of these other diseases. HIV, which we know now actually um, originated from non-human primates. Um, we've all heard of avian influenza, West Nile virus, and the H1N1 that unfortunately was um, referred to as, uh, as swine flu, though we know now that um, that the real problem is that the virus has jumped from, from into the human population and, uh, and is transmitted between humans. So that's not a good thing for anyone who's in close contact with an infected individual. However, it is a good thing for those of us who love pigs. So this whole intraspecies um, transmission of organisms is not just a foreign concept. It's happening all the time here in the United States, not always with, with huge um, pandemic uh, consequences, but, but it's happening um, in the United States. And even those that happen in other parts of the United States, uh, in the world, when parasites, um, whether they're viruses or parasites, jump over um, into the human population, now with inter the international movement of animals and people, the global trade, it's only a matter of, of hours or days before those um, infections are, are moving into the United States. And I think there's global awareness of that now. So this um, is one of the, the, well, is the major um, motivators for a project that the United States um, uh, Aid um, for International Development Organization has um, focused on and established um, the PREDICT program uh, this is a, a $75 million program that was established to, to build a global early warning system for emerging diseases that move between wildlife and people. And I'm pleased to say that, that um, this program is it's a consortium of, of organizations, including UC Davis, which is led by our very own Dr. John Mazette, um, who's here with us today. And, uh, and the idea is working in 23 different countries, the orange country areas shown here, um, that we will, by doing surveillance on wildlife, be better able to detect the pathogens that are going to be our next great pandemic diseases. So, again, I'm going to tell you one last story, and this is not, then uh, this is really intended so that you don't leave here thinking, well, wildlife are the source of all evil um, and, and uh, of our pathogens. This is a very different story, and it has the elements of, of, of all great stories. Um, there is uh, violence, death, <laughs> mysterious death of a very charismatic creature, um, the southern sea otter that lives off the coast of, uh, of California. And amongst the many uh, threats to this population, one is a little protozoal parasite, tiny parasite, Toxoplasma gondii. 
um, that causes uh, encephalitis in the sea otter population, particularly in uh, the most important segment of the reproductive population. And then, of course, there has to be sex. And in this case, that's all happening in the intestine of cats. Because this is a parasite that, under, that may infect a lot of animals, but only sexually multiplies in the intestine of cats, resulting in the formation of these hardy egg-like stages, oocysts, that then get into the environment and are transmitted um, from land to sea um, so that sea otters get infected. But sea otters aren't the only ones that can get infected. We can as well. Now, fortunately for most of us, that doesn't have grave con consequences. No symptoms, maybe a flu-like illness that goes undiagnosed as toxoplasma. But there are some populations that are a much greater risk of disease, and that is pregnant women, uh, where the infection can get to the fetus and result in fetal death or congenital infections like this hydrocephalus, and immunosuppressed individuals, HIV or tissue transplant patients. So sea otters in this case are the victims, but there's something else very important. They're also sentinels. They're sentinels alerting us to the fact that, that what happens on the land can impact on what happens in, not only on the land, but in the sea, and make us aware of the fact that when we talk about pollution, it's not all about chemical pollution, that there is biological, what we call pathogen pollution. Of, of organisms, whether protozoa, bacteria, or viruses that affect us by getting into our waterways. So the toxoplasma research has, has uh, clearly um, shown us that we need to think about how we manage our cats, both our owned cats um, and the very sizable feral cat population that we have in California. But it's also done with the One Health approach advocates that, that we do, and that is is makes us think about our, the other factors in our environment. Think about how we manage our runoff, how we manage our wastewater, how we, we make land use changes. What are the consequences of destroying the wetland areas as we've done in California for development? Um, the role that they play in helping to reduce this pathogen pollution. Because we've all, I think, are, if we haven't, we're coming to realize that our health very much depends on the health of our environment. And this is the whole idea of One Health. It is an opportunity for veterinarians. Oops, sorry, got to go back. Whew, that went too fast. It's an opportunity for veterinarians, um, for uh, physicians and public health officials, ecologists and engineers to all come together and address health problems in a much more holistic and integrated way. And whether that's in California or that's globally, we think that the One Health approach has some very um, realistic and practical applications. And if you're struggling to understand what One Health means, what I, I suggest is at this conference, talk to the students because the students get it. That generation understands the importance of this integrated approach. And whether it's in the clinic or it's in the field, whether it's in California or it's globally, this is the way they want to go, and I think that it's our responsibility to help facilitate that. Break down those barriers, as Barb said. So what's our challenge to you at this conference? Be open-minded. Think beyond the species that you normally are focused on. Be brave, okay, while you're here. We know it's scary, but talk to those people around you, those new people, okay, from other disciplines. Because we believe it's those connections and those collaborations that we hope will form from this um, com conference, this summit, that will lead to your aha moments and will lead ultimately to the very big discoveries which will benefit both animal and human health. Thank you. <laughs>